Welcome to the latest episode of Buker and Friends and a brand new version. It's now Buker and Blackman. Will Blackman, you know him 10 years in the NFL, won a Super Bowl with the New York Giants, fourth round pick of the Green Bay Packers back in 2006, pride of Boston College, and he is now part of Buker and Friends. And I am, quite frankly, I'm pumped. I got so many things I need to know that it's going to take at least a year podcast just to get through the things that I want to know, much less <laughs> what everybody else wants to know. But before I go on, welcome, Will. It's good to have you. Thank you. I am honored to be part of this. b well, Yes, indeed. Sounds like, as you said, sounds like a law firm. Hopefully law we don't firm. need one. That we're not going to go anything. Go, go any if you place. need help, call Buker and Black and we got you. It sounds, it does sound like an injury it lawyer, does. right? Late night TV. <laughs> That'll be our commercial. And uh, I, I should have said, also, one of the newest members of NFL Game Day, I caught uh, I caught you working, and dude, it's like you've been you've been doing it for a while. Yeah, man, I've been, it's, it's funny because, you know, when I initially signed with the network, everyone's like, oh, of course, you know, it's easy for him, you know, he played 10 years, but what they don't realize is, I mean, throughout, even since college, the interviews were, were huge, just to be able to speak to the media in a I guess an articulate manner or just just be cool with them you know and every time I finish an interview they're like man you'd be great on tv you'd be great on tv so that was actually part of my auditioning and then uh in the off season I actually did some local stuff wherever whether it was Green Bay or if it was when I was in Virginia with the Redskins and you know I would jump on the air with Fox sometimes so I did do some groundwork well, for those who, who have been listening to the podcast, Will is stepping in for Nicole Zalumis. She was with NFL Network. She was a radio co-host of mine. She's also a brand new mother. And so she ran into a challenge of doing the podcast. She's This is her third, and it was just too much for her. And so ultimately, we decided to change things up, and Will was available. And I have to say, when I first I saw you... I saw an interview of yours. I started like checking all your stuff out that was out there. <laughs> and this is what I think makes you good and what made you so attractive to having you be a part of this is, and it's one of the most difficult things. I was just having this conversation with somebody in interviews, not only talking, but listening. Like you listen to what people are saying and then you come back based on what they're saying. It's not rote in your mind or right. the question. You are you are engaged in the conversation. And it's amazing the number of people that they kind of get lost in their own thinking and they're not they're not present. And so that was the second I saw that I said No, this I appreciate is that. Be well, good. you know what I I learned is that this is this is my one time to talk. Hmm. This is my one time to speak for myself, you know? So sometimes it may start off like, Hey, you know, that was, that was a rough game. And next, thing you know, we're talking about something else. Right. Right. You know, right. cause it's more, it's about me, you know? Right. So let's talk about me. <laughs> um, let, let's really get into the situations and I can go beyond that play. I can give you whatever you want, you right. know, or whatever I want to give. So it was cool. I, I appreciate that. Speaking of which from Providence, Rhode Island, went to BC, Providence. as I mentioned, right? <laughs> and so in recording the podcast, I saw you, you were wearing the Bosox hat earlier, but I didn't see the t-shirt too. He's got the old school Red Sox t-shirt on top of it. So you're, you're going full bore. Now, have you always been diehard? How much of a committed Red Sox fan have you been? And how much of this is they're going to the World Series and it looks like they might get one? How much is that driving your current interest? Well, I've always took you know, some interest in the home team with the Red Sox. But it really wasn't until I, I went to college, you know, right there in B.C. in the heart of Boston. It was, it was funny because just just playing at B.C., we were we were ranked every year I was there. However, nobody cared because the Patriots were winning, the Celtics were winning, the Bruins were winning, right, and the uh, Red Sox were winning. And also, I remember it was my junior year, we also had the Democratic Convention there, too. I actually went there. Wow. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was... It was that's when we very we first I think John Kerry was running and that was the first time we heard Obama speak. And that's when we were like, whoa, really? who's this? dude? I'll yeah, bet. it was cool. I bet. But yeah, it was it wasn't until I went to college it was right there. I could take the take the uh, the train down to Fenway and 
just really fell in love. And I'm a big um, Manny Ramirez and big Poppy fan. Okay. All right. Well, you also, we had a conversation, <laughs> we have a conversation earlier, uh, and I mentioned that my son had a couple of basketball games, and you were asking his age and grade, and I said that he's a, he's a young freshman, had a tough had a tough day. I did, this is the part <laughs> I didn't tell you about. So he went out and he bought a pair of Kobe's, bought them with his own money, yeah. proud of him that he did that. And Very cool. I know Kobe. We go back a ways. And so we took a photo of him with the Kobe's and I sent it. Uh, I, I texted it to Kobe. said, look who bought your shoes. And Kobe sent something back, sent, sent some, some uh, strong-armed emojis and we kind of right. went back and forth a little bit. And then my son said, we're going to send a video when I hit the first three in my Kobe's. So today in the game first game he hits a three to send the game to overtime and afterward he comes up to me he goes did you get that on video for kobe <laughs> for that's his first that's his first thought right that's he was thinking that the whole time right, right. that's funny <laughs> and i like he looked over at me after he hit it and i thought it was you saw me hit that and send us the yeah, OT, and it was no it right. was looking over to see if i got on video for kobe so anyway i did not get it but I alerted Kobe that uh, that we did hit a screen in his honor. To. We'll get the next. But he had to. Yeah. So anyway, but the fact of the matter is, he's a young. We, we were talking about the fact that he was a young. He's a young freshman. Uh, August birthday, and you were an October birthday, right? Which puts in the context going to BC, playing as a freshman, and playing on that stage. Seventeen year old freshman. Yes. Yes, and playing against. What your first? Yeah, uh, my my very first game we played Stanford yeah. on a Saturday night ESPN national TV. We were the only game on, I believe, mm-hmm. and I I was only returning kicks and played special teams that game. But the next week, I think we had a defensive back go down. They were like, "Okay, well, you know, you're going to play a lot in the rotation, and we're playing against um, this is the the, the Miami team the yeah. year." They won in 01, then they went back, and that's when they had the loss to Ohio State in 2002. But I just remember. I went from playing against kids in Providence, Rhode Island. You know, their receivers were 5'9", sure. 160. And the very first guy I lined up against is Andre Johnson. Oh. <laughs> and this dude is 6'3", six, 6'4". Well, six, six, He's like 220. Right. And I just remember the very first play, he ran it out and up. And I just got blown out the war. But they didn't throw it. So I was like, thank God I didn't throw it. But that team was incredible. I mean, yeah. uh, Dorsey was there. They had, they had uh, Frank Gore. Willis McGahey, I mean, Kellen Winslow, I mean, just unreal, yeah. just a, yeah. a monster team. So, yeah, it was crazy. So how did you how did you survive that? Like, what was the adjustment that you immediately had to make playing against guys that had that physical advantage? And I talk about this all the time because when I think about high school players, when they were making the jump from high school to the NBA, that people couldn't quite appreciate the physical change there. Right, that, that guys are going through because just going from high school to college is a significant change. So that that first year before you could, I would assume, like get into the weight room, kind of kind of work on your body and your game in <laughs> order to acclimate, right? Right, because but, when I got to college, we had to do a two twenty five rep test. Yeah, and this this is the best part. So I was a, uh, I think I was a number four all purpose running back in the country. Okay, therefore at Boston College, I was their number one recruit. Okay. So we, we get in we get into the weight room. So everyone's like waiting to see what's gonna happen. You know, everyone's lifting up. Two of my good friends, uh, they're still my best friends today. They just went up there and ripped about fifteen reps. This is freshman, right? In college. Wow. Guys can't do that in 220? Yeah, two twenty two twenty five rep test. And so I get under there and I barely get one. <laughs> you were get. you were K D. You were Kevin. I Durant. barely got yeah, I got one, like one and a half. Wow. And everyone looked at me. I was like, don't worry about it. Wait till we put these pads on. I, I can play. But that was so funny. They were like, look at this dude struggling. This is the number one recruit. I was like, man, I didn't lift weights. I just played ball. Right. But right. Uh, going back to what you said, I, I was the little brother. I had I have an older brother. He's seven years older than me. And just just from his name is Leon. And, and just from that, it was just a challenge just to always try to compete against him. Sure. 
And same thing in my neighborhood, all the kids were older. So I, it was always, always a challenge to go and compete against them. Mm-hmm. And then wherever I played, no matter what level it was, I was always the youngest. Yeah. So for me, it was just about embracing the challenge and taking it on. And I just had this, this mindset no matter where I went. I remember uh, my freshman year at Bishop Hendrickson High School, I actually went to training camp with varsity. So I'm a 13-year-old freshman. I went to training camp with the varsity, and I got my butt kicked, hmm. right? But I, I, was, I still have my own. I gained so much respect, but coach decided, he said, you know what? He's too young right now. I want to beat him up. Right. But I, I took on the challenge. So that, that was just my nature. So making the adjustments to the college is the same deal. Yeah. I truly believe, and I've talked to, I did a, this is going to sound like a, a reach, but I did a book with Yao Ming. And there was another guy, Wang Zhuzhu, who was drafted first. He was the first Chinese player drafted. Okay. And Yao, even as big as he was, every level that he went up, he struggled. And he had to figure out, he had to figure it out. Because he wasn't, he had size, but he wasn't, and he had hand-eye coordination. But he wasn't, like Wang Zhuzhu was a classic, could run, jump, agile. Yao wasn't like that. He was more of a cerebral player. He had size. But he kind of had to figure out how he was going to play. But that, having to face that challenge, when he got to the NBA and he's the number one pick, and his first game against Indiana, he had more fouls than rebounds. And I went in to see him and I thought, oh my God, this is not good. This, this is, <laughs> there's such, such a big deal being made out of this guy. Like, what's, what's his mental frame going to be? And he right. said, he looked at me, kind of smirked, and he goes, nowhere to go but up. And he, but he knew how to work. Like having that kind of debut, I don't know if you've experienced this around guys who were gifted or were older or were always kind of the favorite or the dominant player. But when they finally meet that test, they're not used to it being like, I need to be responsible for this and affect it. It's, it's got to be somebody else's fault. It's got to be the system we're running. It's got to be the touches. I'm, it's got to be something That's the majority. Else. That is the majority. Yeah. That and is I, the majority. That's why I, f- I feel like the the minority that do make it think like y'all. Like I, I, I was always the, the dominant one. I was always the best one. And then when I met my match, hmm. okay, how do I figure this out? Yeah. You know, I always feel like I could have done something better to put myself in an advantage. So I would imagine, though, that some of that came from the fact like, like you had that resource because you grew up as the younger brother, because you grew up playing against older kids. So you'd been in situations already where you had to be resourceful to compete rather than right. just being Always had to find dumb. a way. Yeah. Always had to find a way. Yeah. Because even, even making the transition from college, college, I didn't really study that much. I just... What was out there and became an athlete. When I switched from defense back to receiver, we had a you had to learn a system, you know. So we had a real structured coach in Dana Bible. Matt Ryan was my quarterback, so I had to be where I was supposed to be to get the ball. But I still didn't study as much film as I thought I needed to. So mm-hmm. when I got to the pros, I wasn't making any plays. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. I'm diving all over the place, and you know my uniform is filthy, and I'm I'm not doing anything right on defense and. Funny story. So I, I was like, you know what? Let me try to figure this film thing out. So I went back once again. I'm at the point where I'm at my match, right? So let mm-hmm. me figure this out. So I go back to the stadium. This is in Green Bay, and it's about 8:30 at night. And I go in there, and the and the films are the film room is already uh, fluorescent with the blue light from the uh, projector. Right. When I walk in, somebody's in there already watching film. But it was like stadium style seats. So if you imagine, they they go up. So yep. somebody was at the top. And it's Charles Woodson, right? And he said, come on. He said, come on in, Buck. And I'm like, all right. He said, have a seat. So basically, he just, he showed me everything that he did, like formations and, you know, certain plays he can figure out and all these things. And then when I turned on the light, the whole grease board looked like a chemistry lab. So basically, Charles was in there making a game plan within the game plan. Wow. The crazy thing is he he didn't practice a lot either. Mm-hmm. So that's why I was trying to figure out how come he's making all these plays and he's not practicing. Right. So that's when the light switch went on. I was like, oh, that's how really good athletes are able to play a long time and even become great. Yeah. So once again, anytime I met my match, I had to find a way. So that was that was my deal. That's good stuff. So with that in mind, one of the other things we talked about, and I'm curious where you fit in which category. Because we I was telling you a story, <laughs> and I wish I could remember 
who it was that told me. It was an NFL player. It wasn't like Kirk Morris and some guys that I've done some shows with. But I love Kirk. It, yeah, me too. But he, he said, when a guy gets hit for the first time in the NFL and you get hit as hard as you've ever been hit in your life, which is guaranteed to happen. Which is going to happen at some point, right? And there's three reactions. There's the reaction of, man, that didn't feel good, and I don't want it, I, I don't I don't want any part of that. I gotta find a way to avoid that happening again, however I can. I still like playing the game, I still want the money, I still want all that, but <laughs> I didn't like right. that. And then there's other guys that are like, Okay, that didn't feel good, but it's part of the deal, so I gotta figure out how to play with it. And then right. there's the third, the I don't know if I don't know what category that you put them in. The the LTs, the guys who that hit, they're like, give me some more of that. That was good. I can't even feel my I can't feel my legs right now. Man, I can't <laughs> wait to do that good. again. <laughs> right. So you know what? As you said that, I took some notes. I'm gonna break that into three categories for you. Okay. That would that might make sense. Okay. So the person that gets hit. And there's like, okay, I like the league, I like the money, but I didn't sign up for this. Right. Those guys play two years. Okay. Okay. Two years because they, you know, they sign their contract, the money's good, they like the lifestyle. Right. The guys that are trying to figure it out who get hit, they're like, okay, I get it, that's part of it. They play five years. And then the next category of the guys who love it, they love getting hit ten years. Got it. Because you have to. Because those are the ones that are able to handle. They're the ones that are able to handle adversity. Yeah. yeah, they handle adversity. So when I got smacked, <laughs> yeah. okay, we were playing um, Tennessee Titans, I believe, and I was the punt returner. I was, that's pretty much what I did the first six years of my career. I returned punts, mm -hmm. and the ball was in the air, and I, you know, I always looked up and peeked, looked up, peeked to see if guys were coming. And usually, I was like, you know what, I got this. So I caught the ball, and I forget, who, I true, honestly, I forgot who it was because I just got cracked. Mm -hmm. I mean, my chin strap broke open, my. My chin split open. Wow! I just heard I heard the whole crowd go woo in, in Nashville, mm. and my teammate, I think it was Corey Hall, a linebacker, went to Boise State. He he ran up to me and helped me off the ground. He said, "My bad, Will. That was my guy." <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh! But but the funny thing is, before that, I used to let the I used to let the ball hit the ground a lot uh -huh. because I didn't want to get laid out. Right. Or I would catch it uncomfortable, but when I got smacked, yeah, it did something to me. I just became fearless. I didn't care about getting hit anymore. Huh? So sort and of. You, I, if I survive that, I can survive anything. Yeah, that's okay. That that's what it is. All right, right. I'm glad I got out the way. Right. I'm always curious the timing of it, and especially this is the, I had this conversation with with Mike Vick, and you know how fast Mike is, right? I asked Absolutely. him what was the biggest adjustment, and he said the speed of the game, which just startled me to hear that from him. But I think it's Sounds, from yeah. not speed of the game, it's mental it's speed mental. of the game. Yes, 100%. How, every, how quick just, everything happens. Just so, to be able to process everything. Yeah. So with that in mind, as a punt returner, as a kick returner, especially I mean, the kick, kick return is a little different because you've got time to kind of size things up and make a decision. But punt return, a lot of times, you're looking at a, at a, a bunch of different lanes, a bunch of different guys coming at you at different angles, the ball, the wind, like there's a bunch of different things you have to yeah. assimilate. See, punt returns, for me, that's easy because you have time. You know if it's a left-footed punter or a right-footed punter before the game. So you know the, the ball spins differently. Right. You know the weather because you're already there. Right. You know, so you know what the threats are. But defense, so especially when I switched to safety, that's where it really got cerebral because I'll take a situation where when the Rams played the Vikings in, uh, in L.A., and everyone went up in arms when Cooper Cup was matched against Anthony Barr, the linebacker, and was mm -hmm. wide open. Mm -hmm. Well, before that, you know, you get your pre-snap reads. So the Rams, they were in a condensed formation, which means that they're trying to, you know, get their defense closed in. Right. They also had the tight end that was he was off the ball, meaning it's possible max protection. Okay. It was second and medium, meaning that there's a chance that they can take a deep shot. Or run right. the ball. Right. QB's under center. Stay with me. <laughs> QB's under yeah, yeah. center. So it's possible run. Right. So there was a lot of possibles in that situation. So right. you're thinking about that while you're at safety. 
they can do this, they can do this, they can do this. This guy can go here, this guy can go here. Okay, let me make sure I know my defense, make sure I know my adjustments, make sure he's in his spot, make right. sure he's in his spot, right? Make sure he's the ball snap. You got to know all that within like four seconds, right? Yeah, you know. And if you miss something, which they did because when the ball was snapped, I remember the safety Sandejo, he took off to the opposite side of the field and left Anthony Barr all by himself. Mm-hmm. When you want to, where he could have just stayed in the middle, read the quarterback, and helped him out. Right. So, I mean, that's the thing is to process those things and and that short of time. So, I can imagine what it was like for a quarterback. And pl- and playing against guys, I mean, especially veteran guys, I, that, that to me would, is, is the huge difference between playing against some of the rookie QBs that are coming in so fresh now, versus the guys, the Brady's, the Rogers, the Roethlisberger's who have seen everything and. As you line up, and they can immediately immediately make an adjustment and communicate the adjustment and do it under under pressure. You got guys, the, the QBs that are just coming in and learning the league. There's no way that they can they can present the same issues to you as a, sa- a safety or a DB. I can't imagine that they do. They can't unless unless they have Pat Mahomes' arm. <laughs> then, <laughs> then, we, then you have a problem because he could he could get as far as you want. But that's why you see nowadays. Especially the rookies right now, when in doubt, yeah, they run. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, Trubisky right. had almost ninety yards rushing. He led the team today, and right. that was the thing with Vic. When in doubt, Vic knew he could run. Yep. But ultimately, that's that is not a long term solution for any NFL quarterback. You have to be able to operate from the pocket efficiently to be able to take advantage of everything that you have around you. You you have to do that, but also you also should be have a coordinator that knows how to use your skill sets. Right. And I look at, you know, Carolina, they basically run the same offense that Cam ran in college. Right. It's Cam is a running threat, but mm. if you give Cam time, Cam will shred you. You know, even though I'm not, I was never afraid of Cam as a passer, mm-hmm. but he's capable. Right. Right. Well, that's one of the things I want to get to. I don't know if we'll get it to it in, in this podcast, but I want to throw like – Playing it against an Aaron Rodgers versus a Tom Brady, all things equal, who would you who would you rather play against? <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that at some point. You mentioned the consensus. You want to talk about it? Okay. Yeah, I do. I do. I, I want to save. I want to save that because I think that's a okay, whole other okay. subject. You brought up Pat Mahomes Sunday night. They put a whooping on the Cincinnati Bengals, forty-five to ten. Made it look easy. I don't know that anybody expected. I I expected it to be a little more competitive. I expected the Chiefs to win, uh, especially at home, and especially with the Bengals' record <laughs> in prime time. Being from Cincinnati, I'm well well aware of 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 the struggles when it comes to that. But all that said, you look at what Kansas City did to uh, Sunday night. You look at what they did against the Patriots a week ago. You look at how powerful that offense is. But the questions about the defense, where where do you put them in the hierarchy of the AFC contenders? Who do you who do you consider the best team in the AFC as of right now? The, I think that we're oh, pretty close to the midway point. Yeah, well, right now for me, I'm gonna I'm gonna be you know just go with the obvious choice for me, and I still think New England. I think New England caught their stride. I think it was huge for them when um, Edelman came back because I think he he's the fire. He's you know, who Tom Brady loves going to. And then uh, to get the two running backs going, I think Sonny Michelle went down, which is, would be a huge loss if they lost him. But they had him, James White, and, you know, get uh, Josh Gordon going and, and Gronkowski. I mean, on paper, they just look great. But I think they caught their stride right when they needed to. So right now, for me, it's 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 always going to be them. And so who's – and I agree with you. I've got I've still got the Patriots there. Largely because I feel like whatever their personnel is – you give Bill enough time and he's going to figure out how to utilize it to the best of his advantage. He's going to put everybody in their sweet spot, whatever it is. You can right. you can line it up and you can say, boy, they're, they're, they're not very talented in these places, but he's going to find a way to make put to put guys in a place where they can be most right. effective. And what, what people have to understand is for a little over a decade, Bill has been taking everyone's best shot every single mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. So every every offseason teams, if you're in the AFC, your your job is to either be like the Patriots and eventually try to beat the Patriots. Yeah. That's it. They know when it comes to playoff time, we gotta get through New England. Right. So every week he's he's taking somebody's best shot. So I think right now for him to 
you know you're going to play against a powerful Chiefs who's putting up all these points. If you to outscore them, right? you figure out a way to outscore them. You're like, we're not going to stop them. We're going to do what we can, but we're going to find ways to put points on the board because they have weaknesses on their defense. So with that said, is Kansas City your next best team? Are you looking yeah. at... They are. Yeah. I like the Chargers. I like their balance. I think their defense is better. Last year, if they had made it, they were kind of my dark horse to... Right. There's, there's there's a grittiness and there's a there's a balance in their team that I like and I'm a big believer in in Philip Rivers. You give him a chance. Um, you know, they just had a slew of injuries last year and Kansas City as of going into the weekend was giving up the most yards of any defense in the league. I don't know that you can survive that way. You can score I think you can be a regular season team and blow people p- uh, out offensively. But you get to the playoffs, and I think it changes. I think you have to be able to come up with a stop, and I'm not convinced that Kansas City against the best teams. We saw it against New England. I'm just right. not convinced that they're capable of doing that. When It's almost like if they have the ball last, I like their chances because they're going right. to find a way to get it in the end zone. If they don't, then I don't like their chances if it's a one-score game. Well, what I do take in consideration is that this is essentially is a, a, a brand new looking defense. I mean, you're missing your two starting safeties. You don't have Sorsen, you don't have Eric Berry, but you have two. I mean, you have three brand new corners. You know, you have yep. they bring in Kendall Fuller via trade. They signed um, Orlando Skedrick late. They lose Mitchell, the corner. They lose him to uh, Cleveland, mm-hmm. and so they they took their wounds early in the season because they're all trying to get on the same page. It's really really hard as a defense back one if you don't have your. Also, they lost Ron Parker earlier. He went to uh, Atlanta after they released him, and then he came back. And so it's really hard to try to find that nucleus, especially when you don't have your leader. Right. Um, so but they did what they had to do to win. But to, I think tonight was a huge step for them. And you can see different guys just competing all over the field. I think number 24, Jordan, he was lined up on uh, the tight end a lot. And small guy, but just competed, competed. And and their defensive back coach, Al Harris, I, I played with him in Green Bay. And I, I know he's going to find a way to get them right. right. You know, Because I, I can tell just as a defensive player, when you see the things that your offense is doing, I know they're talking. I know the, de- the defense is talking like, listen, we got to – Free this thing. Also, also, they lost, you know, Derek Johnson, a linebacker who right. they might pick back right. up, who's available now. Yeah, no, I get that, and I and I I can see where they'll get better as the season goes on, and obviously, right. But right now, yeah, and well, and I mean, they didn't they didn't nice job against the Bengals. That game got out of hand early, and and the Bengals then had to press, and that's not a good place for them to be. But. I, I hear you in terms of their ability to evolve. I still, I need to see it. I need to see that that is going to come together and that they're going to do it against. Right. You need like three more, you need like two or three more games of consistent yes. play. Yes. Out of their defense. Yes. I feel you on that. So here's the other thing. This is, and this is, I'm curious about, and obviously some of what you talked about is communication, familiarity, uh, consistency. But in watching them through the first six, at least the first six weeks of the season, their arm tackling, their basic tackling <laughs> fundamentals. It's why they give up so many yards. The yards after catch are ridiculous. And like, I want to put this in the right place. Normally people from the outside, they watch and they just want, they blame the first person that they can see. I don't know if that's always accurate. When you have an issue like the Chiefs have had and it's systemic, who does that fall on? Who is is primarily responsible for getting that right on an NFL defense? It's the players because I'm 100% sure that is emphasized every week. Every defense, they chart missed tackles. Every defense, chart they chart loafs. You know? So you get that report on your sheet. every. For them, it's going to be Tuesday. Every Tuesday, you get that report. So it's the players. I mean, the thing right now, and this is, this is league-wide, is that not only do they try to emphasize tackling, but teams also emphasize we need turnovers. We need turnovers. You see, you know, you got you to gotta make these tackles, but then you get that glaring stat that if you're winning the turnover battle, 75% chance of winning the game. Right. You know, something like that. So guys are really going for the ball because they're like, man, one, they probably don't want to hit anybody. 
<laughs> and two, it's a lot easier to get the ball out. And I'm speaking from experience. There were times where, I mean, I was never afraid to hit somebody, but you know, sometimes you, if you can punch that ball out, it's easier. Sure, sure, sure. You sure. know, but that that's the thing that league wide right now, guys are going for the ball a lot. And when you're going for the ball, you're going to get ran over. That happened with uh, Deion Lewis today um, versus the Chargers. Oh, that was a strong, incredible run. You know, they were all over. And it was a great run. But if you watch, everybody went Three for the ball. Three guys were all to... swinging at the ball. Deion Lewis is like 5'2", you know. Get him down. <laughs> He's not 5'2". Come on, man. Don't be a heightist. Don't be a heightist. <laughs> a a heightist? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. But that's yeah, that's what it was today. That's that's how that's what it is league wide. Everyone is just going for the ball and not just trying to tackle. It's these young guys, man. These young guys are killing me. How much? And and I want to I want to wrap. I want to go back to something because we introduced Will at the beginning and pointed out that he's from New England and a fan of all the New England teams there, including the Boston Red Sox. And he's in his full regalia today. But uh, before I get to that, there was one last thing I wanted to ask you about the quarterbacks and the protection that they get and the challenge that guys have now in terms of tackling them and how much how much is that adding to the comfort and the success of running quarterbacks in that once upon a time, you flush them out and they're running. It was like, oh. I get a shot at the quarterback now. Like, yeah, let's Drew try to Bledsoe take him out of the game because of that. Yeah, I mean, and now it's I gotta now I gotta take this guy down the right way, and if he starts to slide and my helmet hits his helmet, we're gonna add fifteen to this, and who knows, I might get ejected. I just feel as if defensive players can't pursue them with the same aggression, and it has made things infinitely easier for the quarterbacks. I look at. Two quarterbacks, Drew Bledsoe hmm. got laid out, hmm. right? And mm-hmm. then Tom came through. And St. Troy Aikman, same thing, mm-hmm. got blasted on the sideline. And even tonight, uh, Pat Mahomes got pushed out, I think by uh, by Dunlap. I forget who it was. Yep. Pushed him out. Personal foul. Yeah. Like, don't even, don't even touch him. T- today, uh, Mitchell Trubisky had a long run. Right. And it's, it's like the Patriots didn't want to hit, touch right. him. Right. I, I, that I, that like, was exactly what I was thinking of, watching that run. Guys were kind of trying to like to size, size him up. Right. Like, how do I Is grab him and throw or... him down? <laughs> it's crazy. Exactly. Well, how, how do you approach like the mindset of a defensive player now? I almost, and, and it's particularly how it's coached. There's a part of me that's like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to take my lick or I just, I got to bring the guy down. And I'll deal with the penalty as opposed to playing with hesitancy. And now it screws up the entire game. Yeah, I don't know. Like anything, you just they're just going to have to adjust. Maybe you run up on him and you pin, pin his arms to his side, bear hug him, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's funny because today, uh, tonight watching the game where Breland speaks, he's, he's the one that didn't want to hit Brady and Brady ran in for a touchdown. So right. today... He ran and jumped on um, what's his name's back right. and brought him down. Oh, so, Andy Dalton. <laughs> right, right, right. So I've been coming up with all sorts of crazy ideas in terms of the solution because I'm all for I'm all for protecting the quarterbacks because from a business standpoint, let's face it, I want to watch Aaron Rodgers. I want to watch Tom Brady. I want to watch Deshaun Watson. I want to watch the the game has been shifted. Of toward the quarterback so much. I want I don't want to see the backups playing because the game is changed so dramatically because there's so much emphasis on the passing game now. But that said, I also want to make it fair for defensive players. So, I was like we should put flags on the quarterbacks or the quarterbacks should be able to like tap their head when they give themselves up and if they don't, then you can have Adam. And I know that none of that is like realistic as far as making it work. But I feel there's got to be some way in which the quarterback has an option to give himself up. And if he doesn't, then he's fair game. I mean, I think the best thing, too, is just how about just an early whistle? Yeah. Yeah. You know, just an early whistle. Because you got guys like Cam, who you can't bring down. Sure. It's tough. You got guys like Big Ben. That's how Big Ben plays. Yep. Yep. He shakes everybody off. He pump fakes everything. and, and, And that's what happens, you know. So... If you want to protect the quarterback, just have an early whistle. If someone gets to him, they grab him, blow the whistle. Yeah, but some of that would help. I don't know if there's a pure solution to it because obviously there's, there's guys that are coming in. There's no pure solution. Yeah, running because at Clay feet. Matthews had two perfect tackles. Yep, agreed. 
Agreed. Two perfect. I mean, textbook NFL play up 60 style tackles. And the the one he even clearly braced himself so that his body weight didn't come down fully on the QB. And they still called him on that and then said that they're going to use it as a teaching video for what an improper tackle is. I thought, you know what? Now you're just sticking it to him. Now you're just being you're just being mean spirited because it's not that. It wasn't anything like that. There was nothing malicious about it. It's crazy to me. I'm over that. All right. I'm so mad. Moving on and circling back because we started out talking about your fandom for all. Can I give you a funny bangle story really quick? After the beatdown Sunday night, I would love a funny bangle story. There's nothing I could enjoy more okay. than a funny bangle story. <laughs> okay. So I'm at the combine, right? Mm-hmm. As a as a prospect, and you get this you get this letter of all the teams that I want to interview. You get a sheet of all the teams that want to interview you. Yep. And one of the teams were the Bengals. So I think I spoke with a special teams coach. He liked me as a returner, and I, I think possible receiver. Okay. They they each have a hotel room. So I go into the room. It's a real dark, just eerie room, right? So I'm in there. All the all the scouts are in there. Um, Marv's in there having a seat. And so they're just like grilling me with questions. And I, I can't remember any of them because you're going to find out. But I totally just was so over the interview. And I talked to the special teams coach. And right while we were in mid-conversation, I look over at Marv. And he is out cold. No. Sleep. No. Don't. Dude. Oh. <laughs> Dude. That's so sad. He, I, and you know, I, I understand. Like, yeah, you had all you had interviews all day. <sighs> I was probably your fifth interview, but the dude fell asleep oh. during my interview. That's dude. I got my stuff. I got my stuff, and I was like, "I'm out of here, dude." Oh, <laughs> I have no answers for that. I couldn't believe it. The dude was. I don't care how tired you are, man. I'm on no. your list, bro. No kidding. No, I mean, and look, it's, this is we're not talking about middle of the season, right? This is the one thing that you're doing the, at this stage. Which is getting ready for the draft. I get it. It's a long combine's a long day. Tons of people, tons of evaluations, whatever. Oh, but cool. dude, I just it was just it was I was there for five minutes, man. Cup of coffee, man. Get a, a cup of Red coffee. Bowl. Exactly. Make it happen. <laughs> Make it happen. All right. <laughs> Thank you. You said it was going to be a funny, not a sad bangle story. That's a sad bangle story. It's oh, funny right now to me. Yeah, it's funny to you. All right. Marvin Lewis is still the coach of the Bengals, and I'm still from Cincinnati, so it doesn't quite have the same joyful ending. Nonetheless, you are from Boston, or, uh, from Providence, but went to school in Boston, fan of all, all teams there, oh. except, of course, the New England Patriots. And I just wondered, where did that non-fandom begin? Was it early, or was it once you were competing against the New England Patriots? It was early. My, in my household, we loved football. My father, Wayne, he coached any kind of type of football you can think of. He coached little kids flag. He coached tackle. He coached women's football. He coached high school football. He coached inmate football. <laughs> he coached everything. But he, but he didn't. I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> but he didn't have, he never had a favorite team. We never had like a flag or something and never really rooted for anyone. So my first uh, interaction with football. My father had this um, film. It was NFL films. Uh, Steve Sable, um, John Facenda. It was the whole. Yeah. I think it was called Inside the Hit NFL. Okay. And I saw Barry Sanders on there, and so I I fell in love the way Barry Sanders played. Hmm. So for me, I just I end up liking players, and by default, I like the Lions. Wow. But then no no one around me was ever you know, all about the Patriots. Even my friends, they like the Cowboys. They like Emma Smith. They like all these guys. Even though the Patriots, tra- they practice at Bryan College in Providence. Right. Yeah. That, that's And I just, I grew up just deciding to be the rebel. <laughs> then when I got older, my friends started liking Patriots and I was whatever about it. Well, and ahead of your time too, because now you see with Guys move and the mobility is more with the with the M, uh, the NBA than than in the NFL. But still, you see guys move so much that I feel as if fans and part this is fantasy too, are, are spurred by fantasy sports. Fans are fan of fans of players rather than fans of teams. Right. As there's a definite division there. So you were ahead of your time. I've also written down for future 
conversations, Will's dad coached an in, coached inmate football. We will be getting to that at some. At well, it, some okay, point. it was a it was a professional flag league, and this attorney he had his own league, and my dad was a correctional officer. Okay, so the the guys, yeah, the guys they weren't in, they weren't in, they were they were out. <laughs> okay, and they formed a team. My dad actually played on that team too. He, my dad was not an inmate, but he worked at the prison. <laughs> wow. All right. I There's, actually grew up. I actually grew up looking up to those guys. Actually, those are the ones that inspired me. They like were, I said, they were good. There, there's more to be had here as far as that conversation is concerned. We're going to end it here. We got plenty of action. Yeah, I, I, no doubt. This was the first Buker and Blackman podcast. Keep in mind, you can subscribe on iTunes so you don't miss a single episode. We're going to be doing this Mondays and Tuesdays. I'm going to be joined uh, on Wednesdays by a special guest, mystery guest, Thursday and Fridays with former NBA center Ryan Hollins to break down primarily NBA stuff. But, Will, tremendous start in our next podcast tomorrow. We will talk about the Jags, one of Will's former teams who he had going to the Super Bowl. Does he still have them going to the Super Bowl, even though there are questions about who their quarterback is? is going to be that next thanks for listening